When police make an arrest, we always hope they've, quote, gotten their man. We all want to believe the police make every effort to track down the truth and have everything they need to put the guilty party away. We want to believe that if a jury believes a man to be guilty, they will convict him. Yet sometimes, lives are altered, questions linger, and the standard of beyond a reasonable doubt cannot be met. In such cases, nobody is brought to justice. Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious here at Odd Mysteries Stories. Questions linger in the case of the Feeney family murders. On February 26, 1995, Cheryl Feeney and her six-year-old son, Tyler Feeney, were found bludgeoned to death in Cheryl's waterbed. Baby Jennifer Feeney, just 18 months old, was strangled with a nylon curtain cord. Husband John Feeney was out of town at the time, but he didn't go far. He was arrested. He was acquitted. No other suspect was ever named or found. Did a cold-blooded murderer go free after killing his wife and children? Or did the police latch on to all the wrong details, allowing the real murderer to go free? You're going to have a lot of questions after you hear all about this strange case. On the surface, the Feeney family was a happy, unremarkable, small-town suburban family. They lived in a nice neighborhood in Springfield, Missouri. John Feeney was a chemistry teacher at Glendale High School in Springfield. He was well-liked and known for being a good teacher. Cheryl Feeney worked as a nurse at Cox Hospital. They had two beautiful children, Tyler and Jennifer. They had a healthy savings account and very little debt. Nobody would have guessed that this little family would become the nexus of a tragedy, a controversy, or a mystery. But some neighbors remembered the Feeneys as standoffish and secretive. John Feeney had multiple affairs and even engaged in threesomes with fellow teachers. Multiple reports say that he acted inappropriately with female students. One of John's former mistresses stated under oath that John had once hinted that Cheryl had secrets of her own, something that would have kept John from marrying her had he known. Apparently now nobody living knows what those secrets were. Tyler seemed anxious and rarely went out to play. In gatherings, the little boy kept to himself. Opinions were mixed. Some people described John as a devoted husband and father, while others described him as having little interest in his children. One witness, Jill Williams, testified that he even became angry when asked about baby Jennifer. Another family friend, Angela Birchler, would testify that John never wanted children. What was going on behind closed doors when the curtains were drawn and prying eyes weren't around to see? Rumors swirled that Cheryl was afraid of John and that she wanted a divorce. John, a preacher's son and an active member of the Church of Christ, would have been shamed by a divorce. Did he murder his family to save face with his church, to stop a divorce from going forward? Did the family's secrets bubble up and over until murder was the only inevitable result? There is a discrepancy about who discovered the murder on the day it occurred. Newspapers reported that Ola Jean Feeney, John's mother, discovered the bodies along with one of Cheryl's co-workers and made it sound like the two arrived together. In the Ozarks True Crime podcast, I'll place a link in the comments below, there is the co-worker who reveals herself as Teresa, a friend of Cheryl's, and the last person to speak to Cheryl before she died. Teresa did not mention going to the house with Ola Jean, who might have arrived later. Teresa arrived alone at the house on Monday, February 27, 1995, after Cheryl failed to report to work and after co-workers checked in with both the pediatrician and the babysitter. It was raining that day. The morning paper was growing soggy on the porch, the first sign that something wasn't right. Teresa also saw that a glass panel on the front door had been painted white on the inside, something that had not been true the last time she visited the home. Usually, the Springfield Fire Department would conduct a wellness check, but Springfield FD was busy at another location, so Teresa volunteered to drive over and check in on her friend. You are likely to be as baffled by what she found as she was. Someone spilled paint in the garage and tracked it all over the house. A paint-covered footprint was on the door, perhaps indicating that the door had been kicked in. The footprints were size 12, 
a size smaller than John's feet. Family photos had been tampered with and turned to face the wall. Did this indicate a killer who knew the family? The home had apparently been ransacked. A closet door was open in the hallway. Cheryl's purse was on the counter and had been gone through. A jewelry box was in the bathtub and the drawers were pulled out. Several items, including the family television, had been removed from the house and moved to the trunk of Cheryl's car. Teresa saw that the car's hood was open and that someone had attached a battery charger to it, but the battery was not dead. The beige paint that had been tracked through the house was also painted on the walls. Someone had taken the time to paint the letters D-I-E and B-I-T on the wall. Was the message meant to be die, bitch? Was the killer interrupted? Was it a nickname for Cheryl or one of the children? Or was this incomplete message all part of the show? Eerie reminders of the trio's last moments were scattered about the home. A humidifier, running but empty, sat on the fireplace mantel. A ceiling fan issued a soft thump-thump as it turned overhead. There were no painted footprints outside of the home. The painted shoes were never found. Crime scene investigators found several details at the scene of the crime that make it difficult to identify a murderer or even to pinpoint the true time of death. After murdering Cheryl and Tyler in Cheryl's bed, the killer turned up the heat on the waterbed to the highest possible level. This meant the body decomposed faster, making it difficult to determine the time of death. Do you think this fact suggests someone who would have known the effect that heat would have on the victim's body? Unidentified hairs were found on Cheryl Feeney's blood-stained nightgown. DNA testing was not as advanced in 1995 as it is today. Unless they are tested again, we have no way of knowing who they belong to. The same is true for two unidentified gray hairs found at the scene. The police also found unidentified fingerprints on a light bulb in the garage. Did they belong to someone who handled the light bulb before it was sold? to the Feeney family, or perhaps to a handyman who might have installed it? Or did a murderer truly handle the light bulb on that fateful weekend? John Feeney's defense lawyer, Sean Askinosi, claims the police failed to look for prints in places they really ought to have checked, like Jennifer's crib and Tyler's headboard. He says they kept a piece of wall as evidence, but not the door, which he said was equally important. Do you think these forensic details point to an as yet unidentified suspect in the case? or? Are they ultimately irrelevant red herrings that direct attention away from the real culprit? On Saturday, February 25th, John took the one and a half hour drive to the Tantari Estates, a resort at the Lake of the Ozarks, where he would attend a work conference. 1,800 educators and private sector executives gathered for seminars and parties, all in the interest of improving science education in the state of Missouri. John himself was scheduled to speak at the conference. Meanwhile, Cheryl got on the phone with her friend Teresa. Baby Jennifer was sick. The two nurses discussed the antibiotics the doctor was likely to prescribe and which might be the best for Jennifer's illness. Later that night, John went to dinner with one of his mistress's fellow science teacher, Pam Probert. At trial, Probert would tell jurors she and John had intimate relations, but that she had never had intercourse with him. That night, police pulled Feeney over for driving 52 in a 35-mile-per-hour speed zone. They issued him a ticket and held on to his driver's license because he lived over 50 miles away. John and Pam were scheduled to attend some parties that evening, but John told Pam he had a headache and that he was going back to his hotel room. At 9.15 p.m., John called Cheryl and had a five-minute conversation with her. He then drove to Osage Beach PD where he paid for the ticket and picked up his license. He then claims he returned to his room numbered 517. John claims he was sleeping in room 517 until 11 a.m. that morning. However, police found a receipt among his belongings that showed he'd gone to a local McDonald's at 6.59 a.m., where he bought himself a breakfast. John claims he merely forgot about buying breakfast that morning. Cheryl and the children likely died the morning of the 26th, According to the prosecution's theory of the crime, John left his hotel room, made the hour-and-a-half drive back to his home, murdered his family, and returned. He kept a mileage and gas log, which was consistent with his story, but which was easily fake. 
By Monday the 27, the concerned calls from family members and friends were all piling up on the Feeney family answering machine. John himself made the very last check-in call. John even called Springfield PD to request a wellness check, but by the time he did, the police department was no longer interested in giving John any information. The bodies had already been found, and John was already a suspect. John's friend Steve Chodrick spoke to John in person on the morning of February 27th. They then returned to John's room. John's father then called to tell him his wife and two children were dead. Chodrick remembers John crying, saying over and over again, This can't be. This can't be. The McDonald's receipt shows that John was up early that morning. Early rising was not normal for John Feeney. Multiple co-workers reported he slept in on numerous occasions and that they often had to cover for him because he was often late for work. Do you think John was up early that morning because he had never gone to bed at all, but was instead spending the dark hours of the night driving to Springfield? Police questioned John three times after he returned home on the evening of the 27, gathered evidence from his car suitcase and other belongings, and worked 50,000 hours on the case. As investigators scoured his financial and insurance records, John retained Askinosi's attorney services. On Askinosi's advice, which would be standard defense attorney advice, John refused a polygraph. Nevertheless, John did voluntarily provide blood and hair samples to the police. During the investigation, John complained that police were trashing his reputation in the community. He quit his job and even briefly launched a lawsuit against Springfield PD, which he later dropped. In January of 1996, almost a year later, police convened a grand jury that indicted John in April 1996. They then arrested John Feeney for murder, and the case went to trial. The case is further complicated by the fact that nobody has ever found the murder weapon. The murderer used a pipe about a half inch in diameter to hit Cheryl in the head ten separate times. Reports say... Her skull shattered like an eggshell. Tyler was beaten to death with the same pipe. Tyler's skin developed a curious cross-hatch pattern. The murderer placed a pillow over Tyler's head after he died. The murderer used a curtain cord from within the house to strangle baby Jennifer. Reports indicate she struggled for several minutes before she ultimately perished. Police searched John Feeney's classroom desk and found character sheets for White Wolf's vampire, the masquerade sometimes misreported in some news sources as a non-existent game, entitled Master Vampire. Investigators may well have made up their minds about John then and there. Jurors even requested copies of the game and the character sheets during their deliberations. In 2024, most people know that tabletop role-playing games like Dungeons & Dragons are harmless enough. Many people even picked up the hobby during the pandemic. Yet, in the 1990s, role-playing games were still controversial, and many of the prevailing satanic panic narratives of the 1980s and 1990s focused on the games as tools for corruption. Many believed that people who played these types of games were fundamentally suspect and that such players risked losing touch with reality. Vampire the Masquerade is billed as a game of personal horror. Players take on the role of newly turned vampires from various clans and factions who must now deal with the reality of becoming monsters. Much of the game revolves around vampire politics. It also revolves around the characters' attempts to hang on to their humanity either committing greater and greater sins while feeling less and less, or trying to mitigate their need for blood by doing as little harm as possible. While most gamers who play the game play their vampire characters mostly as troubled anti-heroes, some White Wolf players are known for going as, quote, edgy as possible, diving deep into the game's most disturbing content and playing the darkest and most depraved characters they can. Nevertheless, there has never been any evidence that playing role-playing games would lead anyone at all to snap and enact a murder fantasy on their family. And while the nature of a person's character choices, in general, says very little about what they do in real life, it is worth noting that John's gamer buddy of a decade, Matt Fairlay, sat on the stand and told a jury that John never played murderer characters. We called him Goody Two-Shoes, he said. He described John as playing good characters, 
those who followed the law or as lawful good in D and D parlance, and who wanted to arrest foes and bring them to justice rather than shoot first and ask questions later. Of course, anyone who plays tabletop role-playing games also knows how to act and tell a story. Prosecutor Ron Carrier would even speak to John Skill as a game master when suggesting that the entire crime scene had been staged. He suggested that John had laid it all out for the major players in the hopes that they would come to the conclusion that robbers or gang members had committed the crime. The state brought in a New Mexico State certified lecturer on the occult and ritualistic crime to examine the die bit message on the house's wall. The expert ruled that the painting was part of a staged crime scene. A state handwriting expert would also testify that the handwriting matched Feeney's John Feeney is the only suspect ever arrested for this case. On October 5, 1996, a jury acquitted him. Nevertheless, many believe that John did kill his wife and children that fateful weekend. Five months before the murders took place, John Feeney took out an additional $250,000 life insurance policy on his wife, Cheryl. It's possible that this was an innocent move. Missouri was offering teachers a deal on life insurance at the time. But it's possible the money offered a motive for murder. Cheryl Feeney would have had to sign off on the application. Handwriting experts who testified at John's trial said that Cheryl Feeney's signature was forged. The $250,000 life insurance check wasn't the only check John could expect to receive after Cheryl and her children perished. The house was vandalized, and John reported that over 300 items, including jewelry and electronics, had been stolen, so he was able to collect an additional $250,000 from his homeowner's insurance policy for a total of $500,000. The police certainly believe this money served as a motive. Feeney shocked the community by moving into his house as soon as police released the crime scene. Many saw the move as cold-blooded, while others saw it as merely pragmatic. Would you live in the house where your spouse and children had been brutally murdered, even temporarily? During his closing statements, Prosecutor Ron Carrier said at trial, he did it for greed. He did it for fun, power, and freedom. Detective Rita Sanders was one of the investigators on the case. She'd known John from shared chemistry classes and seminars. She says that a few months before the murders, John asked her about another case, one where a husband was convicted of killing his entire family. He asked what the husband had done to get himself caught. Sanders reports answering the question, Was John's curiosity innocent, or was he planning to get away with murder months before committing the crime? What do you think? Did John free himself from an inconvenient marriage and collect a hefty check in the process? As mentioned, John Feeney reported that 300-plus items were missing from his home, and items had been moved around. While prosecutors and police believe that Feeney inflated the list of missing items to increase his insurance payment, they were unable to produce any evidence that he was lying about the item. Insurance policy investigators were apparently satisfied that he was telling the truth. After the murder case, Cheryl's parents, Mr. and Mrs. Hash, launched a civil suit against both Feeney and his insurance companies in an attempt to block him from claiming any money from their daughter's death. They dropped the suit a few months after filing it. Detective Sanders noted that there was $40 in the ransacked drawers that an alleged robber had apparently missed. The paint damage was the only damage, which meant Feeney's repair bills would ultimately be low. The battery charger on the car was, in her mind, consistent with a staged crime scene, meant to suggest the robber meant to drive off with the television and other larger items, only to change his mind when he couldn't get the car started. What do you think? Do you believe an incompetent robber missed the cash and a chance to steal a car that had a full battery? Or do you believe someone staged the crime scene in the hopes of throwing the police off the scent? What about John's lovers? Four women testified they had affairs with Mr. Feeney prior to the murders. None of them seemed to be in love with John, and one even claimed John used mind control to get her into bed. However, all testified that John showed no interest in divorcing his wife, indicating that the question had come up. A jealous lover seems like a possibility, if a far-fetched one. Kimberly, Ray, Michelle Norgren, Palm Proberg, and an unnamed, unmarried middle school teacher in Springfield 
would all take to the stand to admit sleeping with John Feeney, but most seemed neutral towards him. The affairs were not ongoing in 1995, though, of course. John and Pam were still friendly enough to have dinner with one another on the night of February 25. Police never matched any of the hair or fingerprints found at the scene of the crime to any of these women. During John Feeney's trial, the prosecution worked hard to gloss over the issue of Tyler Feeney's diagnosed case of hepatitis B. Hepatitis B is usually a sexually transmitted disease, which means someone could have sexually abused little Tyler at some point. Would such a horrific act explain the little boy's ongoing issues with anxiety? The disease did not come from either John or Cheryl. Police tested John. As a healthcare worker, Cheryl would have been tested before being allowed to report to her job at Cox Hospital. Neither of Tyler's parents were the source of the illness. No person who might have abused Tyler was ever found, but if an abuser existed, they certainly would have had a motive if they thought Tyler either had revealed their identity or was going to. County reports on hepatitis B cases were compared to a list of 150 people who had contact with Tyler. Police never found a match. However, this does not mean all 150 people received hepatitis B testing, only that none of them had ever generated a report by presenting to a healthcare facility with a case of hepatitis B. In addition, while hepatitis B is primarily a sexually transmitted disease, it is not solely transmitted through sexual contact. For example, children have been known to pass the disease between them through playground cuts and scrapes. Do you think there is a monster out there who abused Tyler and committed a murder to cover it up? Do you think prosecutors were wrong to de-emphasize Tyler's diagnosis? Because prosecutors brought forth no known eyewitnesses and had no physical evidence linking John to the murder, much of their case was circumstantial. In the 90s, there were no traffic cameras to catch John's car coming or going and any physical evidence linking John to the crime scene, such as semen, fingerprints, or DNA could be explained away by the fact that John lived in the home. Feeney's neighbor, Tootie Deeds, testified that she saw Feeney's garage door raised slightly on the afternoon of Sunday, February 26, 1995. But the garage door was closed when police found the bodies the next day, and John's presence at the conference served as an alibi for that time frame. The prosecution did present a witness, Ron Gann, a convenience store clerk who said he sold gas to Feeney in Springfield on the morning of the murders. However, time card records would ultimately show that Gann wasn't on duty that day. Do you think Gann was wrong? Or do you think the time card records were wrong? Did Gann insert himself into the case hoping to feel important? Or did a coincidental mistake in the records allow a murderer to go free? After the case, jurors admitted to some uneasiness. Many said they believed John Feeney committed the murders, but felt the prosecution had nevertheless failed to prove their case beyond a reasonable doubt. In some news reports, jurors stated they felt the prosecution had failed to tie John to the crime scene. There is evidence, in this case, that jurors never got to see or hear about, either because investigators decided not to pursue the evidence, or because Sean Askinosi, the defense attorney, blocked the evidence from being admitted. For example, Detective Sanders saw a video of the traffic stop where Feeney received his ticket on the night of February 25th. In it, she saw that he was wearing a web belt, also known as a military or skater belt. Detective Sanders says she saw the same belt rolled up on the counter at the crime scene, noting that police had not found a web belt on John's person, in his suitcase, in his car, or his hotel room when they searched and questioned him. Did John, hoping to avoid blood splatter, take off his clothes before committing the crime and place them on the counter, only to neglect to remove the belt in his hurry to leave the crime scene. There is also the matter of a then nine-year-old neighbor who, as an adult, told Ann Roderick Johns, Springfield native and host of the Ozarks True Crime podcast, that she told investigators that she saw John's red car parked outside between the hours of 2 a.m. and 4 a.m. on the morning of the 26th. She thought it was strange, as John had never parked outside the garage before. If this is true, this little girl could have been the crucial eyewitness who might have placed John Feeney at the scene and put him away. Did investigators fail to take a young girl seriously when they should have listened to her? Or is this a case of an adult 
misremembering an event years later, innocently and erroneously attaching it to the events of the murder. Police records do not shed light on this lingering question either way. Who did the hair on Cheryl's nightgown or the gray hairs found at the scene belong to? At the time, DNA could not be extracted and matched, but technology has evolved. What would a new DNA test reveal? How did Tyler Feeney contract hepatitis B? Did someone kill him, his mother, and his sister to conceal the sordid secret of their abuse? Nothing in my research could be found about the partners or spouses of John's extramarital affairs. Could one of them have taken revenge on John by murdering his family? These important questions remain unanswered. What was Cheryl's deep, dark secret? Could it have come back to haunt her? Did her children get caught in the crossfire? Did one of John's mistresses secretly burn with passion for him and kill the family in the hopes of making him her own? After all, at least one of those mistresses was also a mere one and a half hours away from the family home that night, and because she was never a serious suspect in the case, her movements are unaccounted for. Was it all a random act, a robbery gone wrong? Shortly after the murders, John Feeney began attending the Kansas Expressway Church of Christ up to three times a week. He stood before his entire congregation and admitted he hadn't lived right before the killings. He asked for the congregation's prayers. He ultimately moved to Ecuador, where he now teaches English at Centro de Educación. Double jeopardy laws mean that John Feeney may never again be tried for this case, even if new evidence proves his guilt once and for all. But the haunting question remains. Is a murderer having fun in the sun while his former family lies cold in the grave? I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting new videos each Monday and Friday. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other videos on your screen. Thank you.